Okay, so in this lecture, I want to talk about some arguments for determinism. And remember, the basic determinist argument is this. For anyone to be responsible for an action, it must have been possible for that person to do otherwise. They must have been able to act differently than they did. Two, it is never possible for any person to act otherwise than he or she did. Conclusion, no one, so no one is ever responsible for any action, for anything they do. So if you look at the determinist argument, premise two is the important one. Not only is it the important one, it's really the only thing besides the conclusion the determinist and the libertarian disagree on, right? Libertarians think for us to be responsible, we have to be able to do otherwise. They just think we usually can, right? Determinists think we never can. So premise two is going to be the key one for the argument, it seems. Well, then our question is, what kinds of independent arguments can we give for premise two? Why think that premise two is true? It's a little bit of a tongue twister, right? Premise two is true. I'm kind of surprised I've said that right twice. I will not test things, right? Now, look, I, I think we should have some doubt here about premise two, right? At first glance, Premise two seems false, right? You know, wh why do I say that? Well, look, it just does seem to me pretty clear I can choose what to do, right? I can, I'm actually doing it now, stick my left arm straight up in the air like I'm raising my hand in class, right? You could do that too if you chose to, right? You might be doing it yourself. You might be, okay, well, I'll do that. You might be saying, that's silly. I'm not going to do that sitting here listening. But you can choose whether you do this, right? I'm thinking, do I want a cup of coffee as I sit and record these lectures? I can decide whether I go down and put some coffee on to have a cup of coffee, right? I'm perfectly free, or so it seems to me, to make these choices. There, there seems maybe nothing more obvious, right? Are you free to move your arm? Well, move it. Yes, you are, right? Now, look. A response to this is, of course, just to say just because something seems a certain way to us doesn't mean things actually are that way, right? I look out at my backyard and my larger neighborhood as I'm sitting on the second story in my house recording these lectures and it looks very flat, right? You go out and look at the ocean, it looks flat for as far as the eye can see, but we all know that it is ever so slightly curved, right? The earth is not flat, the earth is round. Even though it looks flat to us, there's a very, very slight, imperceptible, tiny bit of curve that adds up over time, right? Some other stuff, you know. If you were just looking and you had no astronomy classes ever, it looks like the sun revolves around the Earth, right? It looks like the sun is what's moving and we're what's staying still, right? You watch it, you know, don't stare at the sun, that's a terrible idea. Please do not do that, and please do not tell anyone, my philosophy professor said, go stare at the sun, right? I did not say that. But if you were to stare at the sun, it moves in the sky, rises in the east, moves through the sky, and sets in the west, right? It looks like the sun is moving and we're sitting still. We all know that's not true. If you've taken some physics or remember your high school physics, you know even though tables and chairs and stuff look like solid objects, actually atoms are largely empty space. You know, there's a bunch of space between the electrons and the nucleus. This table looks solid, a knock on it. Actually, 
at the atomic level, the table is mostly empty space, right? So things might very well not be what they seem. But the okay things might not be as they seem response is not a slam dunk, right? You know, we believe the Earth is round because we have all this evidence it's round, right? Pictures from space. The fact that when ships get far enough out in the ocean, they just drop out of sight and instead of continuing to get smaller, right? We think objects are mostly empty space because we have all this evidence that, you know, this is how particles work. Loads of experiments, right? We, you know, at most, this things might not be as they seem to us argument shows that the fact things seem to us a certain way doesn't settle the issue, but it itself is not a very good argument to think things are a certain way. Even though it seems as though determinism is false, determinism could be true, is not at all a convincing argument for determinism actually being true, right? We need a better, more powerful argument than that. Well, what kinds of arguments have people offered for determinism? I think there are broadly three sorts. Theological, scientific, and logical. Um, Taylor gives you a logical argument for determinism. Not logical in the sense, oh, well, you know, it makes sense, it's logical. Logical in the sense that he thinks the, the laws of logic show determinism to be true. Um, he's not the only one to ever do this, but these are actually the more unique arguments. You know, Spinoza and Leibniz in the history of philosophy seem to also, especially Leibniz seems to offer something like a logical argument for determinism, but they're pretty rare. Um, they're actually kind of novel, kind of interesting. And we'll focus on that because that's the kind of argument Taylor gives. I do want to talk about the theological and scientific arguments, though. Just, just say a little bit about them, why we're not going to put a lot of weight on them. So, theological arguments for determinism have actually been pretty common. One motivation here is the idea that human choice, humans having freedom, is in some way at odds with God's power. Now, this is very, very controversial. You'll, you'll see this in some Protestant theology, some kinds of, you know, Reformed or Calvinist theology, it pops up. You know, that's the most common place. Pops up in Islam some too, but it's it's fair to say this is not entirely accepted by any religion, right? Christianity or Islam or Judaism as a whole, none of them buy this idea that somehow giving humans freedom of choice isn't compatible with God's power or his grandeur or whatever, right? A more common one is that according to the Abrahamic religions, you know, in the Bible or the Quran, you'll see claims about people receiving knowledge from God about what will happen in the future, God himself saying what will happen in the future, right? Um, you know, the one that springs to my mind is, you know, Jesus saying to Peter, you will betray me three times before the cock crows, and lo and behold, he does, right? Well, this seems to create a problem. If God knows the future, doesn't that mean the future is set and we can't do anything differently? If God knows person X will do Y, how is it possible for person X to do something different, to do Z instead, right? Um... There were medieval philosophers who tied themselves in knots about this, how it was possible that even though God knew we would definitely do something, we still could have done otherwise. These debates get complicated, but look, 
I'm not going to get into the theological debate, the theological arguments for determinism for a couple reasons. And those just are, you know, as I've already said, theological arguments for determinism are controversial even within religions themselves, right? You know, there's hardly ever been a consensus, not to my mind, ever been a consensus within any, you know, religion that determinism is true, right? And even if there were, right, how convincing would this be for everybody, right? Even if some religion came to the consensus, okay, determinism's true, nobody has freedom of the will, well, that would only, you know, that would only be convincing to people who were believers in that religion, right? If you believed in another religion or you were just an atheist, wouldn't really have any punch for you, right? So for that reason, I don't think that theological arguments for determinism are really all that convincing, all that powerful. There have also been scientific arguments for determinism, reasons why science supposedly says determinism is true. And I think there are, you know, two basic reasons for the scientific argument for determinism, although these are pretty closely related. One is just science can predict many events with certainty, right? You know, scientists can tell you when the next eclipse will be with absolute certainty. They know this, right? I don't wish I should have looked up the date before I started you know, recording this, but they know this exactly. They know this about other stuff in the sky. They are very good at predicting, say, astronomical events, right? Well, there's another idea, you know, that the universe is causally determined. Every event has a cause, and every cause necessarily determines a certain event, right? Now look, neither of these arguments are slam dunks, right? You know, look, if, if every event was predictable then there would be a good argument that the future's set that you can't do otherwise than you do, right? But there are certain things we just really are very bad at predicting. The weather long term is one of them, right? Your weather prediction stops at about seven days because, you know, more than about seven days we're just bad at predicting the weather. You know, some of them will go ten days, but the thing you notice is the ones that go 10 days, the 10-day forecast is not super reliable. Don't make travel plans on the 10-day uh, forecast. My wife and I did that over Christmas. We had one, no, two full days of just like freezing rain, right? Because we trusted the 10-day forecast. Really, about seven days is about as accurate as a weather forecast will be. Holds for other planets too, right? You know. Scientists are constantly su surprised about what Jupiter's weather is doing to the extent we can observe Jupiter's weather or look at the way people behave, right? We cannot yet predict the next recession. Ask a hundred economists. One of them will probably guess right, but that's only because they'll each guess something different, right? You always see this in the newspapers. This is so-and-so who predicted the last recession. Like, he can predict the future recession, but what they don't leave out, you know, there's 200 guys, there's thousands of guys who made a prediction, they all got it wrong, this guy got lucky, he's not got, like, magic powers to predict the next one, right? And he'll probably get the next one wrong. And, you know, of the things we can't predict, human behavior seems to be one of them. Determinists will say, well, you know, we just don't know enough, one day we'll be able to, I, I don't know. Plus, and now look, whenever anybody, whenever anybody who's not an actual physicist talks about what quantum physics says, this should to some degree set off your BS detector, so take what I say about quantum physics with a grain of salt. But quantum physics, what I know about it at least, suggests that causal determinism, in science at least, is false. Um, you cannot say 
what causes an atom to decay, you know, radioactive atoms, at one time rather than another, all you can say is it has an X percent chance of decaying, right? You know, lots of things, if the quantum picture is true, don't seem to be causally determined. At the subatomic level, a lot of things seem more or less random, right? You can say they have a certain percent chance of, ha of happening at a certain time. You can't say that they will definitely happen at that time. And if they do happen or don't, there's no reason you can give why it happened now and not later, right? Particle decay, atoms decaying is one of those things. So, it, you know... I'm not going to get too deeply into the scientific debates, but the picture now is, you know, some people will say that maybe at the quantum level things are determined, but we just can't see they're determined. But at the very least, the science is unsettled. It is not, there is no slam dunk case for determinism based on science. From what I know, the science tends to suggest that determinism might not be true. Even at best, you can hardly say, though, that science obviously shows determinism to be true. Maybe future science will settle this. I don't know, but you can't just wave your hands and say, well, science says, right? Well, this is these reasons are, I think, why Taylor reaches for a logical argument. Logic rules of thought, rules of logic. We don't need to go investigate, wait for what science says. We can just say, well, logic, that shows that determinism has to be true. So, interesting strategy. You guys can see why he pursues this strategy and doesn't want to go for the scientific or theological arguments. I don't think he's a believer, so he wouldn't go for the theological ones anyway. But you can see why he doesn't really throw out the scientific one here why he wants to give us this logical argument. All right, so next lecture, I'll start to unpack the logical argument he gives for determinism. And then in the next few lectures, we'll see how well it stands up.